would you please stand and join us as we begin our worship? come and join and Lord that uh, we would just keep our focus on you through this service in Jesus name amen well I do have a few announcements and uh, today right after service we invite everyone to stay we're gonna have a short uh, meeting and we have some new members that we're gonna affirm the uh, Bissingers are joining our church and the votes are joining our church so uh, Stay and yeah, let's, let's celebrate that. So that's, uh, that's right after service and we invite, if you're a visitor, just, just stay. It's gonna be a real short uh, gathering. I don't even wanna call it a meeting. It's gonna be a gathering, the family come together. And so uh, come and be a part of that. CR, we've got a guest speaker. If you've never been to a Celebrate Recovery uh, evening, tomorrow at six o'clock, we got a guest speaker that uh, is going through several different CRs throughout uh, the Oregon area and speaking at them and so come and enjoy that tomorrow night. Family camp uh, coming, registration is going to start next week and so family camp is a great time to just come and fellowship and kind of come together as a family up at Camp El Cannon. And then City Fest is happening, uh, you're going to start seeing some flyers out uh, so look for ways to uh, be a part of City Fest. And I want to, uh, oh, and we're having a special offering today. So all of our offering coming in uh, is going to go to the Philippines uh, to help with the relief because of the shutdown because of COVID. And also to Otinawa, which is in Uganda. That's an orphanage that we support. And so we'd like uh, to take our offering today and then take that and we'll send it off to those two ministries um, right away. And so that's what we're going to do today with our offering. And I'd like to uh, take a, a little bit of time to... Uh, share with you VBS and I don't know did anyone notice kind of our special guest over here did you notice yeah does anyone know who it is who is it Peyton Goliath yeah and he was actually that big Kelly got a tape measure out or Don one of them and measured it and that's exactly how big Goliath was so even bigger than James Campbell 
So I that's pretty cool. So I'd like to take a moment, David, if you'd play that video, um, just some pictures of VBS and how that went. Just wanna sing the blues Feels like a song that never stops Feels like it's never gonna Gotta get that fire, fire back in my bones Before my heart, heart turns into stone So will somebody please pass the megaphone I'll shout it on the count of three One, two, three Oh, hit my pretty night I'm singing to the sky come up please and uh, while she's doing that Nora took all of our pictures and put that together for us so thank you Nora for doing that oh, almost not quite all right so Lorraine was our director this year she put all the pieces together and called volunteers and so I got just a couple questions and you had a lot of good help right but So how, how many kids did we end up having come? We had 29 the first day, and we had about 48 the last day, but over, there's probably 55 different kids, and they were great, yeah. So 55 kids that we reached, all not at one day, but, but through the week, yeah. Because we didn't give them back because they were told no. Yeah. 
Yeah. Oh, yeah. And then our missions, Deb did a great job with missions, and she used missions that our church are sponsoring, and so the kids would come back and bring money each day, and so what did they do? Hey, kids, how much did you earn? How much did you bring? One thirty-seven ninety-eight. All right. And Lorraine, really, we, we appreciate all you did. Um, but let's have all all of those that helped or were a part of VBS just stand for a minute. And if you do that, come on, just there we go. Look at this church body. We just came together. So, yeah. All right. Thank you very much. Lorraine, do you have anything else you want to say other than we're looking to next year? Because you keep talking about, oh, next year we'll do this, and next year we'll do that. So, Well, we did have tremendous help. And from the teens to the grandmas and all those in between, I uh, had a great kitchen staff, and um, they all did a tremendous job. Kathy Fergie led the prayer team. We saw God answer prayer over and over and over again. The kids, the first day, made a quilt block, and those are the, uh, we made two quilts that will go to Itinawa and go to the orphanage there. And they did a great job. And Linda Miller and her team stayed until 5 o'clock on Tuesday and put them together. And then somebody quilted them and somebody bound them. And it takes a whole village, doesn't it? So thanks. Oh, don't leave yet. So, yeah. And, and so, um, yes. Yes, you did a fine job. Yes, Kathy worked our kitchen, did a very nice job. So, thank you. you know, we'd like to, to just let everyone know that you're part, you prayed for our, our VBS, you did a wonderful job, so thank you very much. And um, I had several parents just say, man, you guys just pulled together, what a team. And um, you know, that, that's, that's a really good witness for us to do that. Lorraine, we got a, a small gift. Um, if you divide it out by the hour, it's probably about 25 cents an hour. But um, anyway, because you spend a lot of time and we do appreciate it, we wanted to get you a quilting something but i didn't know where to go and i was thinking the dollar store but anyway um <laughs> we'll, we just gave you cash so oh. you can figure out where to go instead of a certificate and no material <laughs> what's well, up to her she's got it larry so lorraine thank you very much we appreciate it and i've got kids that's yes All right, good. So I'd like the kids that are gonna come up and help Kelly lead one song from VBS. So come up right now, now's your time. Come up, hurry, hurry up on the stage. Do you need a mic? Don't be shy, come on up. So we sang some really great songs during VBS and when I was talking to Pastor John, he said, well, uh, I'm going to be preaching on Trinity. So we are going to do our rendition of Holy, Holy, Holy. And um, if you would join us in the chorus, we would love that. And if there are any, like, people that are, like, my height or a little taller, if you want to come up to the side, we'll stand down here. But we're giving, we're giving the stage to the kids. Okay, so when we get to the chorus part, please join us. I will praise your name, you are the Lord, you are the Lord, yesterday, today, forevermore, forevermore.
I'm on now? Okay. I think one of my takeaways from DVBS was you do a ministry like that and you think we're going to serve kids and we're going to hopefully make some impact in their lives, and I think we did. But I know that when you send young people overseas on a missions trip, so often what you hear is that the biggest difference isn't so much what they do overseas, but what happens in their own hearts. And I, I think that the group that served this week, this last week at DVBS, uh, it was a unifying experience for those people. And the way that everyone came together, younger and some older folks, watched some older folks chasing kids this last week, but I just think the way the church came together and served together was, um, I think that was significant as well, and I, I think it probably made a difference in our lives um, because of that. So I thought it was a great week, um, and I think the report today, you know, reminds us of that. I'm gonna read today from Deuteronomy chapter six, and I'm going to read the first 15 verses. This is a very important text in terms of the, the history of the Bible and the, the Old Testament people of God. Let me ask you a question. When you think of the most famous verse in the Bible, what's the answer? John 3.16, I didn't hear any other options. Someone could have suggested something different, but I was anticipating you would say John 3.16. And that is, I think, the most important verse in the Bible from a cultural standpoint. You used to watch football games, and you know, you'd see that John 3.16 signs. Well, in the Old Testament, of course, it wasn't John 3.16. There wasn't a New Testament yet. So the Old Testament people of God their verse, the most important verse in the whole Bible for them, was verse 4, which is called the Shema. And it's coming from the verb meaning to hear. And so as I read this passage, which has to do with the oneness of God, that God is one. Uh, listen, this is the word of the Lord. Now this is the commandment, the statutes and rules that the Lord your God commanded me to teach you, that you may do them in the land to which you are going over to possess it, that you may fear the Lord your God, you and your son and your son's son, by keeping all his statutes and his commandments which I commanded you, 
all the days of your life, that your days may be long. Hear, therefore, O Israel, and be careful to do them, that it may go well with you, and that you may multiply greatly, as the Lord, the God of your fathers, has promised you in a land flowing with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord, our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes you shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. And when the Lord your God brings you into the land that he has swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give you with great and good cities that you did not build, and houses full of all good things that you did not fill, and cisterns that you did not dig, and vineyards and olive trees that you did not plant, and when you eat and are full, then take care, lest you forget the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. It is the Lord your God you shall fear. Him you shall serve, and by his name you shall swear. And you shall not go after other gods, the gods of the peoples who are all around you. For the Lord your God in your midst is a jealous God. Least the anger of the Lord your God be kindled against you, and he destroy you from all the face of the earth. Well, today, as we spend just a few moments in prayer, we want to pray for Mark Kinney. Mark and Patty Kinney are missionaries that we support in the Philippines, and they're still not back in the Philippines because of COVID. They've never been able to get back. They're currently living in Texas. Mark was working at a summer camp and fell off a ladder and uh, fractured his back. Uh, he will recover, but he is in lots of pain. And if you know Mark's story, you know that he's had a variety of different accidents um, and had lots of physical injuries. So his recovery will probably be very long. So we need to keep them in our prayers. Also, Betty and Jean Fuller reported last Sunday that he fell getting out of his fifth wheel trailer over here in the RV park and he broke five ribs. They have now moved to Hermiston, which I think is a good move for them. I don't know that we'll see them in church given their, their age and so forth, but we wanna pray for them and for Jean's recovery and also just for that transition. Uh, we're continuing to pray for Jackie with her treatments and Phyllis Hansel as she recovers and just ask God's blessing upon our worship service today. So let's spend a few moments in prayer. Father God, we do come before you today and we do praise you. You are the holy, holy, holy God. We've read a passage of scripture that reminds us that you are one. We are to reverence you. We are to fear you. We are to serve you. We are to love you with all of our hearts, with all of our minds, with all of our souls. Through the New Testament, we know that you're a redeeming God. Well, we know that from the Old Testament also, but through the New Testament, we know of Christ. His work is clearly portrayed for us. We thank you that you are a redeeming God. We thank you that you sent Christ into the world to save us from our sins. And so as we acknowledge you and we acknowledge your greatness, we also acknowledge our need for you and for your grace. We are sinners by nature. We are sinners by choice. We have fallen short. We confess our sins to you today, and we praise you that through Christ, our sins are forgiven. As far as the east is from the west, so far you, do you remove our transgressions from us. Lord, we pray if there be someone here in this room today who does not know Christ and therefore does not have forgiveness of sins that you will work in that person's heart and in their mind that they will come to know Christ and they will come to know you your goodness and your greatness 
Father God, we do pray for needs within our congregation. We do pray for the Kinneys today and for Mark as he's in pain. And we pray for a good recovery for him. We pray that you will minister to him. We pray for Jackie as she undergoes treatment. Uh, we pray for Phyllis as she also is recovering. And the Fullers as they've moved. We just lift these people up to you. You know each situation. You know each need. We pray for wisdom for doctors and for therapists and those who are working with them. But more than that, Lord, I pray that in their weakness they would know your strength, that in their weakness they would know that you are the good shepherd, that they would know that they are indeed in your hands. And undoubtedly there are many needs that we are not even aware of, and we lift those up to you also. We pray, Lord, that you will just comfort us with the knowledge that if we are in Christ, we are your children. Father God, we do thank you for a great week of Bible school. We know that many seeds were planted. We know that you are the one who causes those seeds to grow. Well, we do lift up those children to you, and we ask, Lord, that uh, you will make what happened last week spiritually profitable in their lives as they move forward into the future. And we know, Lord, that uh, you are the one who does this. And so we just commit that work to you. We thank you for the opportunity to be part of it. As we now continue in our Sunday morning corporate worship, we, we recognize that the Holy Spirit is the one who teaches us. We recognize that the Holy Spirit is the one who guides us. And so we ask him to be present with us to turn this room into a sanctuary where we will be changed. Help us to see you today, the one true and the living God. And so we commit our minds and our hearts to you. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. I almost did it again. Would you stand with me? We're gonna to say together the Lord's Prayer. We want you to learn the Lord's Prayer if you do not know this prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
come before you, a holy God. Lord, we just ask that our eyes would be open, our hearts would be open to your word as we worship in it today, Lord. That Pastor John would uh, deliver a message, bless him as he does that, Lord. And we just ask that uh, you would really do a work in our hearts, that we would leave different today because of you and your word, and that the Holy Spirit would just do a cleansing within us. So, Lord, we seek you today in Jesus' name. Well, we are going to spend some time today wandering around in the Bible. We're going to look at a variety of, of different passages. We are thinking today about the Trinity. The sermon title is, Trinity is the Christian Name for God. I like that title. Do you like that too? Yeah. Trinity is the Christian Name for God. I did not think that up. That comes from Karl Barth, who is a Swiss theologian whom I disagree with on many, many, many things. But I like, I like that title. Trinity is the Christian name for God. The Bible school curriculum was very God-centered. And it was interesting to teach one day and then listen to some other of the lessons. There were kids who asked some pretty profound questions I was teaching a lesson, and a kid started to ask some questions about, well, Jesus, he's God, right? Well, what does that mean? I think the child said, he's half God and half man. I said, no, he's, he's all man and all God. But then I had to say, you know, we don't have time for this right now. <laughs> but obviously, kids do think about these things. They, they can ask profound questions. I'm going to ask you to think pretty deeply with me because Trinity is a very deep subject, and quite frankly, it is far deeper than our minds can go. We can state what the Bible teaches, but we cannot fathom out in a way that is fully satisfying to us. But I want to begin with the first verse of the Bible, which I think you all know. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That is what is called a merism. A merism is a literary term, and it really means something like this, A to Z and everything in between. So in other words, God created the highest heavens, He created the lowest earth, but the thought we have to have in our minds is He created everything in between those two extremes. He is the one true creator of all things. Now, can you imagine with me a time when there was nothing? No church building, no trees, no grass, no stars, no world, no universe, no God. Can you imagine that? I'm asking you, can you imagine that? Can you imagine a time when there was nothing? Absolutely nothing. I'm going to ask my kids to answer the question. Are you paying attention? If there was a time when there was nothing, absolutely nothing, what would there be right now at this moment? Nothing. Good answer. So the Bible begins with the affirmation that there has always been a self-existent, eternal God who has the power of being or existence within himself. He is like a flame that cannot be extinguished. A flame without a beginning point and a flame without an ending point. He is the God who is. And this is the God who has created all things. All created things come from His hands. Everything from A 
to Z and all that which is in between. Here's another rather profound thought. God, the eternal God, the God of the Bible, has never been alone. So before God created anything, before God created us, there was only God, and this eternal God was never alone. I have heard it stated before, perhaps you have as well, that God created us because he was lonely and needed some fellowship. That statement is wrong on so many levels. It is wrong on the one hand because it suggests the idea of some deficiency within God. Loneliness is awful, is it not? We need other people. If we start to suggest that God needs something or someone because he is deficient, I don't think we want to go there because we rely upon God to meet all the neediness within ourselves. So God has never been alone, and yet Christians are what we call monotheists. Now that's a big word, but I think you can understand what it means. I appreciate it in the VBS curriculum. They used the big words, and then we explained what those words mean, like the three O words. Kids, remember the three O words? What is one of those three O words, Peyton? Omnipotence. Yes, that God has all power. So monotheism is a word with a prefix, and the prefix, of course, is mono, not to be confused with the disease, mononucleosis. Mono means one. So my son is an aviator. So if you fly a monoplane, you are flying a plane with one wing. If you fly a biplane, you're flying a plane with two wings. So mono means one. The root there in that word is theism, which is the Greek word for God. So monotheism is simply the affirmation of the existence of only one God. And as I said, Christians are monotheists, and yet we believe that God has never been alone. So how can we believe in one God and yet say this one God has never been alone? Because we believe that there are three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So the way that we state this, the way theologians state the doctrine of Trinity, is that God is one in essence or being, and that God is three in person. It is a profound mystery. It is a wonderful truth. Now, this statement is sometimes rejected, and I think it's important for us to talk about this just for a moment so that you're prepared. If someone comes to you and says, at the center of your religion is a view of God where you say that he is, you say the Trinity is a proper way of talking about God, and yet the Trinity is a contradiction. By the way, if you have some missionaries come to your door, as they came to my door just a couple of weeks ago, I cut them off at the pass. And I said, by the way, Trinity is not a contradiction because I could see it coming, because that's what they've been taught. I'm, of course, thinking of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, also known to us as the Mormons, although they technically don't refer to themselves as the Mormons anymore because they had a revelation, and now they refer to themselves as the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, which they always have 
in the past, but that's now the official way of referring to themselves, which does make conversation with them difficult and awkward because you want to be polite. But it's really hard to get all that out. I know that the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints believes this, but the Baptists believe this over here. When they came into my house and I walked down the stairs and I said, by the way, you've walked into the house of the Baptist pastor. And they said, well, wonderful. What do Baptists believe? I took advantage of that. <laughs> so you might have a situation like this where someone actually comes into your house and in the course of conversation says, surely you must be wrong because the Trinity is a contradiction. On the one hand, you're saying that God is one, but then on the other hand, you're saying God is three. Now, clearly that cannot be right. Would you know how to respond to that? Respond this way. If the Trinity is teaching that God is one in essence and three in essence, then I agree with you, we have a contradiction, but that is not what we are saying. Or if we say that God is one in person, and then that God is three in person, then I agree with you, that is indeed a bona fide contradiction. God cannot be one in person and three in person at the same time and in the same relationship, but that is not what the Trinity teaches. No, what we are saying is that God is one in essence. God is one in one way, and He is three in person. He is three in another way. That is a mysterious statement, but it is most certainly not a contradictory statement. So the distinction between essence and person really is significant. God is one in essence and He is three in person. His unity is in one aspect. His persons, that there's multiple persons, is a different aspect of who God is. Now, I want to say something about the word person, because the way that we use that word in English can sort of trip us up, or it can distort in a way that we need not be confused. When we use the word person, we almost always use it with the assumption that a person is a being. Our English word person is coming from Latin, and it is the word persona. So when the church fathers chose to use this word person to describe the Trinitarian relationship, they were not thinking of a person as a being. Our belief is not that God is three beings. God is one being, but there are three personas within this one being or essence of God. So when the church fathers used this word, they chose it carefully because the word had a connection to the artistic arts. Think of a play. There are certain plays where there is a, an actor and the actor plays more than one character within the play. And so in the ancient world, how you would designate this in part was by a mask that you would use. So you're playing one role, and then you set that mask aside, and you pick up another mask to play another role. Now that could be confusing too. If you know where this could go, it could lead to modalism. 
which is a heresy. Let me stay on the tra straight and narrow by just reading my notes. The triune God is one being with three personas or personalities who subsist simultaneously and eternally within or under the one underived being of God. Does that hurt your head? The word subsist, our word subsistence means a wage that doesn't measure up. Or a subsistence wage is a wage which just barely enables you to survive. It is under. Or a submarine is a boat that doesn't sail above the waters. It sails beneath the waters. And so we're talking about three persons or three personas or three personalities. And we're not modalists because these three personas, they exist simultaneously in, under, or within the essence or the being of the one true God. Now that does hurt your head, but I also hope that in the midst of having your head hurt, you're able to say, this is profound, this is marvelous. God is great. I'm going to take a drink of water. How many ounces can this cup hold? I thought maybe eight. You think 16? I don't know. I'm... See, that right there reminds us that we're finite, doesn't it? We don't even know how many ounces can go in this cup. Somewhere between eight and 16 ounces. There's a saying in theology that in English translates this way, the finite cannot contain or comprehend the infinite. We are finite creatures. Let's assume that this cup can hold 10 ounces. What would happen if a million gallons of water came flowing down into this cup? How about if the Pacific Ocean, could this cup contain the Pacific Ocean? Of course not. And I use that as an analogy for our stumbling around to try to understand who God is in terms of He is one in essence and three in person. And within this one essence of God, there are these three personas or personalities that exist simultaneously and this is the God who created all things the God who himself is uncreated but this God who's never been alone because he's always been Father Son and Holy Spirit a relational God now, we have structured a lot of the service today around Trinity. We've sung songs about the Trinity. I read to you from Deuteronomy chapter 6, the Shema, and verse 4, the most famous verse from the Hebrew perspective in the Old Testament, which affirms, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. So we believe in one God. The uniqueness of God is also expressed in the Ten Commandments, is it not? The commandment that reads this way, you shall have no other gods before me. Now what does that mean? Especially the statement before me. You shall have no other gods before me. It doesn't mean that we can have other gods so long as the God of the Exodus or the God of the Bible is the biggest or the most important God. No, the statement besides me means in my presence. 
So the Bible says we can have no other gods in the presence of God. Now, one of the O words that we learned in Bible school this week is the word omnipresent, which means that God is present everywhere. God is infinite. There is no place where God is not. He's in the highest heavens. He's in the lowest earth. He's right here present in this room. So if this statement means you shall have no other gods in my presence and the presence of God is everywhere, this is a statement of God's uniqueness and his unique claim to deity. It is a command to us to worship him and to worship him alone and exclusively. So again, these are statements, and we could add so many other statements throughout the Bible in Isaiah, in the 40s of Isaiah, that the Lord is one. There is no other God. But I want to take you now to the New Testament, where we're going to spend some time. John chapter 1, verse 1. When we come to the New Testament, we discover something. And what we discover is that Jesus is referred to as God. And that the Holy Spirit is referred to as God. And so the Bible, again, you begin to see and sense the tension here. The Bible is talking about the unity of God. There is only one God. And yet the Bible has no difficulty in saying God the Father is God, and God the Son is God, and God the Holy Spirit is God. And I think there's no better text for us to ponder over today than the opening verses in John's Gospel. What's called the prologue of John's Gospel, which is the first 18 verses, but we're really going to just focus on the opening verse. But let me read the first five verses to you. John's gospel begins this way. In the beginning. Heard those words before? Where you heard those words? You heard me say those words today, didn't I? In the beginning was, or in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. This is a deliberate echo to Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, the first chapter of the Bible, the beginning point. John wants us to think of Genesis. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. God. There are attributes of deity attributed to him in verse 3 because he creates. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. So the word is the creator. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. I think most of you are aware that the English word used in verse 1, it's the Greek word logos. You heard that word before? So I want to read this verse again using that Greek term. In the beginning was the Logos, and the Logos was with God, and the Logos was God. Now, if you pay attention here and notice this, and I want you to see this, this statement in verse 1 both distinguishes the word from God and identifies him as God. Do you see that? The Logos, the Word, is distinguished from God and identified as God all in the same verse. 
Now, the Bible has a variety of words that translate into English using the English word with. The word was with God. I can think of at least three Greek words. There's the word meta, M-E-T-A. There's the word sin, S-Y-N. So not sin as we think of it as falling short of the glory of God. It's a different word, S-Y-N, not S-I-N. I'll give you a word that we know that comes from this Greek word, the word synagogue. Or the Greek pronunciation would be synagogue. What was the synagogue? The synagogue was essentially the Old Testament church. So the beginning of that word, S-Y-N, means with. So the synagogue is the coming together, the meeting together, the believing people with one another in the context of corporate worship. So it's a word that describes the relationship that I have with you at this moment. And guess what? I'm not sitting in your lap, am I? I'm trying to maintain my distance. There's the old story of the, the little girl who visited church one Sunday and the pastor, he was just everywhere. He was screaming and he was carrying on and he was just all over the stage. And this is back in the old days when you had the microphone and the cord that connected you someplace behind. You had to be plugged in and this little girl, partway through the sermon, turned to her mommy and said, Oh, mommy, I'm sure glad that he's chained. You know, what if he got loose? What would he do? Would he come out here and grab me? You see, the word sin means with, but it suggests some distance. It's not the most intimate of words within the Greek language that could be translated using the English word with. And meta is not the most intimate word. No, there is, an a, there is an additional word, and it's the word that is found here. It's the word pros. P-R-O-S. Let me read the verse and insert that word. In the beginning was the logos, and the logos was pros, with God, and the Logos was God. The Greek word pros, if you look it up in a lexicon, the definition you will find there is face to face. That's a lot more intimate, isn't it, than meta or sin? Face to face. Eyeball to eyeball. So the word that's being used here is suggesting to us, focusing on what we call the first two persons of the triune God, the Father and the Son, that for all of eternity, they have been in a relationship, enjoying a relationship, using this word pros, which is a way of suggesting to us a relationship of deepest intimacy a relationship there, there is a oneness, a unity. This is why God has never been lonely. And yet, even though John chooses this word that suggests such deep connectedness and such deep unity, we recognize that this word does distinguish between the two persons. And yet John, without skipping a beat, goes on to state, and the word was God. You could translate this a variety of different ways. You could translate it this way, and God was the Word. Either 
is correct grammatically and either is correct theologically. So John 1.1 1, 1 is teaching us that the Logos can be distinguished from the Father, but he's also identified himself fully as God. Do you begin to see from this one verse why it is that the church believes in Trinity? The church did not invent the Trinity. No, the church saw Trinity taught within the pages of the Bible. And then the Word became flesh, verse 14, He dwelt among us. Look at verse 18, the last verse in the prologue. No one, no one has ever seen God. The only God who is at the Father's side. Literally, it's the idea of his bosom, which is another picture of intimacy. No one has ever seen God. The only God who is at the Father's side, he has made him known. Now, before we move on, let me just make a couple of comments about the word logos. And I am showing great restraint because there's so much more that we could say. But this, I think, is beautiful. Go back with me to Exodus chapter, I believe it's chapter 19. Exodus chapter 19. Exodus chapter 19. Now the context of this chapter is the children of Israel coming out of Egypt. The ten plagues are in their rear view mirror. And they've come to Mount Sinai where they are going to see or catch a glimpse, if you will, of the glory of God. The Bible says no man can see God. They do not see the fullness of God, but God is on the mountain, and the mountain shakes, and the mountain is in a storm, and God is present, and he gives to them the Ten Commandments. That's Exodus 19. It's one of the high points of the entire Old Testament where God speaks the God who's remote, the God who we, we rarely discern him, do we? I mean, we see him everywhere, don't we? He's in the flowers. He's in the beauty of a sunset. God is everywhere. He's left witness to himself. His fingerprints are all over creation. But to actually hear the voice of God, to have God draw near like he does in this passage. And you know what the people did? They were terrified, weren't they? And Moses, you deal with this. When God showed up, he was anything but boring. Now, in the first century context, when John wrote, John chapter 1, verse 1, in the synagogue, the scriptures were read week by week, Sabbath by Sabbath. Now, we do that too, don't we? We're not as organized and as efficient as they were in the synagogue, but we read the Scriptures. So I read to you today from Deuteronomy chapter 6. So they would read the Scriptures. Now, the Old Testament Scriptures are in Hebrew. And by the first century, many Jews, perhaps even the majority of Jews, I think that's probably a fair statement, they did not speak Hebrew. So when the scriptures were read in Hebrew, they did not understand what was being read. Kind of like some of you, if you're old enough and from the tradition, the Latin mass. All done in Latin. Doesn't communicate fully. 
So the tradition developed in the synagogue of a sort of running commentary as the scriptures were read. They would be translated into the vernacular tongue for the edification of the people. Now here's another Jewish idiosyncrasy that you may or not be aware of. They are very hesitant to speak the name of God for fear of violating the commandment against taking the Lord's name in vain. And that's reflected in our English translations, by the way. So often in the Old Testament, when you encounter the word Lord in the English text, it's actually the covenant name of God, but following the Jewish tradition, we're substituting the word Lord. Very interesting. Are you with me? So we're in the synagogue and we're reading from Exodus chapter 19. And because we don't know Hebrew, we're listening to the commentary. These were called targums. They were oral initially, but eventually they were written down. And many of these survive to the present day. In Exodus chapter 19, look at verse 17. Then Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God, and they took their stand at the foot of the mountain. Now Mount Sinai was wrapped in smoke because the Lord had descended on it in fire, and the smoke of it went up like the smoke of a kiln, and the whole mountain trembled greatly, and the people trembled. Verse 20, the Lord came down on Mount Sinai to the top of the mountain, and the Lord called to Moses to the top of the mountain, and Moses went up, and the people said, better him than us. That's not in the text, but I think that's pretty much what they were thinking. They were shaking in their sandals. Now, let me read verse 17 from the Targum. The running translation, this is what the Jewish audience of the first century would have heard. Then Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet the word. To meet the word of God. And they took their stand at the foot of the mountain. And so when John uses that term, he is using a term that a Jewish audience would have understood as a title for deity. And you find that hundreds of times throughout the Targums. So from a Jewish perspective, this word logos already had a loaded meaning as a synonym for God Almighty. The other thought I would simply share with you, and it's not, easy, it's not hard for us to understand this, what do words do for us? What's that? They describe, they communicate, don't they? Words reveal things to us. That's why it's so important to teach a child to read. Because it opens, we say this, right? It opens up a world to that child. It reveals. It makes the world so much bigger. So when we read this word here, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God, we're to understand that Jesus, in a unique way, reveals or communicates to us who God is. Now in DVBS, the lesson that I taught was Isaiah chapter 6. Remember Isaiah chapter 6? Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of His glory. And the burning seraphs who cover their eyes from His holiness from his brightness and in one of those sessions I told the kids you see that quilt back there 
after talking about the angels. That quilt depicts that scene for us. Do you see those angels there with their six wings? And in the middle, you see a crown and you see a scepter. But you know what you don't see? You don't see God, do you? I didn't say that to the kids, but that's true. In Isaiah chapter 6, there's the throne, there's the angels, there's the robe, there's the shaking, there's the singing of the seraphs, holy, 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 they are worshiping God, but you do not see God there. He's too glorious. He's present, but he's not described. The answer to that is actually in John's gospel. Because it is Jesus who uniquely and supremely reveals the Father to us. No one has ever seen God. The only God who is at the Father's side, He has made Him known. So as we close, I ask the question, why does it matter? Why does this matter? Why should we spend time trying to think about Trinity, that God is one in essence and three in person, that he's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Use words like person or persona or the word subsistence and try to help us to understand how he is one being, but within this one being there are these three personas who exist simultaneously and eternally in this one great God. Why does this matter? Because God matters. That's one answer. Let me give you two other answers, and I could give you many more. First of all, God's uniqueness matters to us, matters to God, and it should matter to us. God's uniqueness matters to God. Isaiah 42, 8 reads this way, I am the Lord, that is my name, my glory I give to no other, nor my praise to carved idols. God is unique. He is the only God we worship. He's the Almighty One. And so we should stand in awe of Him. A second thought is just simply this. Only Jesus can save us from our sins. Do you believe that? How many of you believe that? Do you know you're a sinner today? that you've fallen short of the glory of God. You know that wrongdoing should be punished and you know you've done wrong. If Jesus is a mere man, then we're out of luck. A mere man cannot save us. Only God can save us. Only God can pay the infinite price of our sin. And so Jesus needs to be uniquely fully God and fully man, fully man so that he can take our place, authentically be our substitute, but fully God because only God can save his people. Amen? So let us not dishonor God. Let us hold God in highest esteem. Let us not bow before any false gods. And let us rejoice in our Savior. Let's pray. Father God, I do thank you today for the beauty of Scripture. I thank you today for what it teaches us about you, even though it is above us and beyond us. I thank you, Lord, for giving us your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who is also fully divine. I thank you that he came into the world and paid the price to save us from our sins. And I thank you, Lord, to the Holy Spirit who takes truths and opens our minds, helps us not only to understand but also to believe. We've used today the words, I believe in our songs, and we'll use it in our creeds. We believe these things, and we know that we only believe these things because the Holy Spirit has impressed them into our minds and into our hearts. 
Father God, we stand in awe of you, and it is right for us to stand in awe of you as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We worship you today. We give you praise, and we give you honor. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We're going to sing a song. We introduced it last Sunday, and it's about Trinity. It's a beautiful song. We're still learning it. as we
3, verse 6. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. By the breath of his mouth, all their host. The first century church would have read that in the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible. And as they begin to read the Old Testament scriptures from a New Testament perspective, as the New Testament serves as an authoritative commentary upon the Old, this is what they would have read. By the Logos of the Lord, the heavens were made. And by, by the pneuma of his mouth, all their hosts. Now we've talked about the word logos, haven't we? That's the word here in the Septuagint. The word pneuma is the word for Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, pneuma means wind, spirit, breath. It's used all over the New Testament in reference to the Holy Spirit. So as they would have read the scriptures from the understanding of the Trinity and the New Testament teaching, they would have begun to see Trinity even in the Old Testament. By the word of the Logos, the heavens were made. By the, by the pneuma of his mouth, all their host. And so the church fathers read this passage and they said, this is God creating the heavens and the earth. And the hands of God are the word and the pneuma of God, the three of them creating together. And so as we close, let us confess together the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born by the Virgin Mary, he suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy universal church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. I'm going to preach next Sunday from Psalm 50. If you want to read Psalm 50, I'm going to preach from a couple of psalms. Then I'm going to go on vacation. And after family camp, we're going to start preaching. I'm going to start preaching through the book of Exodus and take us through the plagues and, and up to the Ten Commandments. So that's where we're going to go in, in coming months. Father God, we, we worship you today as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Uh, we thank you for this day. We ask your blessing upon the short meeting that we're going to now partake in, where we have the, the joy of welcoming new members into our congregation. Uh, we ask your blessing upon that time, and we pray in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Now, the elders, during my prayer, they slipped out behind, and they've locked those doors. <laughs> No, if you seriously must leave, you have, please, you have permission to do so, but we're not going to give you a break. We're not going to dismiss you and expect you to come back in. So it's a very, very short meeting. And I'm going to ask Todd to come. He's going to serve as our moderator. And if I could ask a couple of you to pass these out. 